What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back for what is my favorite weekly ritual right now, reviewing the latest episode of The Expanse. Episode 6 of Season 5 was called Tribes, for reason I'll be getting to in a moment. But I should warn you in advance that this video does contain spoilers, so if you've not watched the episode yet, go do so now. Also, if you're itching to watch more content related to The Expanse, I've been really enjoying Pete Pepper's channel lately. He made some great videos about the history of the proto-molecule, which for me was a great reminder of what got me hooked on this show in the first place. Ever since I first saw season one and read the first book, Leviathan Wakes, I've had this strange mix of horror and eerie fascination with the proto-molecule, where I'm riveted when I watch it in action, even if the results are frequently disturbing. And with an active sample still on the loose, it's important not to forget all of its potentially disturbing destructive power, even if the threat of Marco and Aris might be hogging all of our attention right now. But getting down to this episode, this was a solid slow burn story. Some folks might be frustrated by the slower pace, but I think the episode did a great job of fleshing out the details of just how rapidly life on Earth is descending into total chaos. But more importantly, this episode gave us some incredible insights into the character of Amos Burton, who continues to be brilliantly portrayed by Wes Chatham. And I know I'm not alone in calling attention to him as my favorite character on the show. But this is one of those episodes where I frequently found myself so invested in whatever scene was unfolding that I would frequently forget that I needed to take notes for my review. And that's always a good sign where you can just sit back and get immersed in a story and stop thinking of it in such analytical and objective terms. What's funny is how even though we're in season five, I still find myself watching the opening titles in full just to hear the theme music and get in the zone before each episode. But as always, I'm going to break down this episode according to specific characters just to savor all the cool little details. As someone who lives in Manhattan, I took a keen interest in the news feed being watched by Avasarala, which shows half of Midtown underwater. As we learn later in the episode, the entire east coast of North America is experiencing catastrophic flooding, which is yet another horrible side effect of Marco's attack. And with so many people missing or out of commission, the government needs capable people to fill in. So Avasarala, she ends up getting recruited by the Secretary General to join a provisional cabinet for the foreseeable future. And aboard the Rosinante, we see the crew preparing to pursue the Zemea. Monica gets a little bit of pushback from Bull when she joins them. But there was this great little moment where we see Holden kind of holding back a smile with pride when Monica reminds Bull of her experiences aboard the Rosinante when it was the first ship to pass through the ring gate. But quick, weird, random side note. I just noticed that actor George Tchortov, if I'm saying that correctly, I'm sure I'm not, but that he's a new member of the crew of the Rosinante. And the reason I bring him up, if you haven't seen Goon, Last of the Enforcer, the flick is absolutely hysterical, but the whole movie is worth watching just to see George's character and his brother constantly talking shit to one of their teammates with some of the most colorful profanity that I've ever had the privilege to listen to. The best action scene of the episode unfolds when some pirates try and board the Razorback, which initially appears to be floating helplessly in the vacuum of space. And Bobby reminds us just how powerful she can be when fully armored up, when she completely, totally eviscerates a few of her targets, and then has this incredible Captain America moment straight out of Civil War, where she's physically holding the two ships together as Alex plants a grenade on the opposing ship. It was easily one of the most badass hero moments all season. But I have a quick question for the diehards out there. We see the Razorback getting away being driven by its own power in spite of having dumped their reactor core last episode. So my question for the engineers out there, is the core only needed for the Epstein drive? I'm assuming that they escape with some basic maneuvering thrusters, but I was a little unclear on that side of things. The real meaty drama this episode is the internal debate within Drummer's crew over whether or not they even have a choice to join Marco. They suspect that at least half of the OPA will eagerly join his cause. And if Drummer and her people don't join him, are they gonna be hunted down anyways by the inners? It's a really interesting predicament, especially when we see just how much hate Drummer still has for Marco for killing both Ashford and Fred Johnson. And Marco's crew, they're having their own internal struggle as well as we see something Philip has never seen. When Marco initially orders Naomi to be thrown into the vacuum of space, and they push back and say, do it yourself. And then Naomi very wisely points out to Philip that Marco would gladly sacrifice Philip's life for his cause, but would never do the same in return. And so bit by bit and piece by piece, we're seeing little moments where Philip's confidence and belief in his father is being whittled down. In any event, some of Drummer's crew call into question Marco's long-term plan, one that does not include Earth's agriculture, to sustain it. 
And Marco admits that belters, they're going to have some hungry years, probably around 10, but eventually they're going to build their own agriculture base, much like we saw in Ganymede in seasons two and three. But what was interesting to me is that no one thought to bring up the fact that due to the ash in Earth's atmosphere, their ability to feed the solar system will be completely crippled for the foreseeable future. So everybody's going to have some lean years, all thanks to Marco. In any case, Marco and Drummer, they swap some crews, a sign of trust, and clearly Drummer's playing a long game. And she's playing nice for now. And there was this great moment where Drummer mentions to Philip that his mother Naomi on two occasions has played a role in saving the entire solar system. And then Philip drops the ball by basically revealing that they have Naomi on board before he stops himself from talking. But as we see, he's completely, totally ignorant of all the great things that Naomi has done with the crew of the Rosinante. So later on, he visits her in her cell to hear all about it. And Marco seems annoyed, but for now, he's way too busy planning his next move as he plots an intercept course to meet the Rosinante head on as it pursues the Zemea. But just like with the last episode, my favorite storyline this episode was on Earth with Amos and Peaches, where we see how due to all the ash obscuring the sun, the Earth is rapidly becoming a cold, wintry wasteland. What it reminded me of most was Cormac McCarthy's astonishing book, The Road, which you can see over my left shoulder with a couple of other books by Cormac McCarthy, who's one of my all-time favorite authors. But The Road is easily one of the most harrowing, disturbing reading experiences that I've ever had. But we see how many people have become refugees looking for aid. Amos has a plan which points them towards Baltimore, which is the opposite direction that most people are headed due to all the flooding. But Peaches, she's in really rough shape no matter what she says, and Amos knows it. And as they travel, they have some fascinating conversations. And part of Amos's philosophy is that he believes there are ways that you can live a good life without being a good person. He knows that he's a killer, but as long as he's working for Holden, he's on a good path. But right now, the rule book has been completely thrown out the window. He knows that civilization keeps people civil, but if you get rid of one, you can't count on the other. But what's interesting is how Amos is ideally equipped and prepared to live in this new world. It's not that different from what he experienced growing up in Baltimore. And in one of my favorite dramatic scenes all season, he explains, I grew up like this. Everyone else is just playing catch up. People are tribal. The more settled things are, the bigger the tribes can be. The churn comes and the tribes get small again. Right now, you and I are a tribe of two. And for folks who want to see more of this side of Amos and do a deeper dive into his history, I recommend the novella, The Churn, which came out back in 2014. And it's one of the many novellas written by James S.A. Corey that fleshes out this fictional setting in between the larger novels. And then after a chance encounter with a refugee, Amos and Peaches learn of this guy nearby who's been planning for the end of the world for quite some time. And he's now shooting anyone that comes on his land. And Amos, he knows that Peaches needs food and shelter badly and decides to try and bluff his way into taking what they need. And we get the scene where he's forced to strip down to show that he's unarmed. But his negotiations are obviously not going well. So Peaches... She puts her modifications to good use, trashes the dude, and then blows him away, splattering Amos with blood. The downside is that she completely collapses from the effort, vomiting all over the place. The episode ends with one of the most interesting scenes all season as Peaches raises these ethical questions about their actions. Admittedly, the guy that killed wasn't the nicest person around, but... What if he hadn't been that way? What if he'd been an all-around good guy? What would they have done under those circumstances? And Amos very matter-of-factly replies, we needed supplies. The implication being that things would have likely gone down in much the same way. And then Amos has this rare soul-searching moment where he realizes that Holden would not have approved. And the reality is that this new world order is one that's going to bring out Amos's dark side. He could probably even thrive in this environment by surrendering to that side of his personality where the strong prey upon the weak. And knowing this, he states, I need to get back to my crew. It's a great line, and it had me howling with glee because Amos is clearly standing on the edge of a precipice and looking down. And the only thing that's going to get him back on the path of the righteous is getting back on the Rosinante, where his unique skill set can be put to the best use. So that's all I have for now. Sadly, we only have a few more weeks of this amazing season of television, but I eagerly look forward to breaking down each and every single episode along the way. But if you enjoyed this review, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, and if you want to talk more about science fiction or Cormac McCarthy or The Expanse or whatever, give me a shout on Twitter at Colbrax. But I can't thank you enough for watching the video. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.